My name is Mary Conquest. I'm your host for Safety Labs by Slice, the podcast where we explore the human side of safety to support safety professionals. We move past regulations and reportables to talk about the core skills of safety leadership, empathy, influence, trust, rapport. In other words, the soft skills that help you do the hard stuff. Hi there. Welcome to a Safety Labs by Slice special. Today we're investigating emerging safety approaches. There are a lot of safety theories, frameworks, and ideas, and it can be confusing for EHS professionals to wanting to implement the best solutions for their organization. What's the difference between safety one, safety two, safety differently, new view, and human and organizational performance? Is one of these approaches more effective than the other? And what about critical risk management, high reliability organizations, behavior-based safety, and even Heinrich? We've compiled a collection of clips where past guests demystify these terms and bring order to the safety theory landscape. Be warned, this is a very polarizing subject and there's no one size fits all solution. So listen with an open mind as experienced HSE professionals, consultants, authors, and academics wade into the debate and help you make sense of what might work for your organization. Pam Woloski, President-Elect of the ASSP Board of Directors. You've been in safety for over 30 years. Have you seen uh, changes in the safety industry's attitudes and approaches to work over that time? Definitely. Thank goodness for that. Yeah, and, and I've, I, I've been speaking a lot about it and writing about it. About 10 years ago, I started to become aware of some what what I still call emerging approaches to how we practice safety. Um, they go by a variety of different names, and you've had several of the thought leaders on your on your program before, safety differently, human and organizational performance, the use of learning teams, safety one and safety two. Um, those have really become ways in which we uh, change the way we practice primarily by looking at how we do occupational safety and health from a systems perspective, as well as from a perspective that is a whole lot more willing to look at the worker as the source of solutions, as opposed to a problem that has to be solved. And and that's something that uh, Ted Conklin says a lot, workers are uh, solutions to be harnessed and not problems to be solved. And so most of those approaches look at the worker as the source of Uh, knowledge and information about how work is done and how to do work safely. And when we engage those workers and use their skills and their expertise, it really uh, completely flips the way we do things. It takes us as professionals out of the role of a safety cop or a compliance officer, uh, sort of that um, uh, almost parent-child way of interacting with workers. Um, And it's really been very refreshing. And so I would say for the past, at least for me anyway, for the past 10 years or so, um, I've really been exploring that and thinking about how if, if I wasn't getting the results that I wanted with the kinds of things that I was doing, then maybe it wasn't the worker. Maybe it was me. Maybe I needed to change my approach. And I've had a lot of success by really just kind of rethinking it that way. Josh Bryant, General Manager of People, Risk and Sustainability at Mitchell Services Limited. My personal view was always, yep, something's happened. Try and understand it, but it's you know it's got to be the person's just done something wrong. Uh, having it, I sort of changed my view when I stumbled across safety differently. So I know there's many schools of thought, and it's been out for a while. But I was first introduced to it by a gentleman called um, Daniel Hammerdell uh, and Sydney Decker himself, and it it was almost for me it was almost like a switch overnight. Like that's how big an impact it had on me. I was like, have I been, have I really been doing this wrong? So, you know, that framework of safety differently was about people are a solution to harness and not a problem to control. And I'm just like, you know what, maybe I've been going about this the wrong way and just trying to change people and not really understand their situations and trying to improve this. And I've been involved in in numerous uh, behavioral based programs and I, and I do I've always got the fact that you are trying to make improvements to the working environment, but the comms always came around to 
well, the person was in the line of fire and the person was doing this wrong and the, the person need to fix this and the things we need to focus on this month is slips, trips and forward and hazard management. That wasn't wasn't actually changing anything in our business. So that's where safety differently also had an impact for me to go, I've actually got an ethical responsibility here for people who work for me to make their workplaces better and to actually understand what they're going through day to day, what's their constraints, and actually what do I need to do to put in place to to make things go well. So you mentioned last time we talked, and I hope I'm not putting you on the spot, but there were three philosophies you said from Safety Different that differently that kind of landed with you or landed with the company. Which we we learned about safety differently and then shared it with the leadership team and said, look, it's it's a it's a new way of thinking and it's gonna push you. And it made them like really uncomfortable, made our leadership team quite uncomfortable. So I was like um, the just the absence of accidents, safety is the presence of capacity and controls. So it just means, well, so like we have to care about when nothing's happening. We have to like understand that. It's like, yeah, you do. We understand understand why things go well. That people are a solution to harness and not a problem to control. And that's probably the really big one, that it wasn't just blaming people when things go wrong. It's actually like, well, let's try and understand that. Like, and, you know, let's go and work with them out in the field. Like it drilling and, you know, I would get, ah, oh, but drilling's drilling and you'll never have to change it. Like, that's crap. Like, talk about it. And you've got new people and new ideas and they see things a different way. Like, try and understand that. And then that last one was safety is an ethical responsibility, not a bureaucratic responsibility. So it's not about just controlling paperwork and making bulletproof paperwork. It is about you uh, people working for you, they are in your care. It's on you to make sure that you are working with them and understand that they are um, offering you're creating a safe environment for them to work in. So, you know, that it was very different for our leadership team. It was it was like, well, you know, you're not just going to get up there and say, like, don't hurt yourself and don't hit yourselves with a hammer. It's like, no, like, it's not actually going to do anything. So that's our campaign was really, you know what, we actually put our hearts on our sleeve and talked to our workforce. All the leaders went out to all the sites and said, you know what, we've we've actually been getting this wrong and we're really sorry um, and we're going to take a new approach. And we, we It's called safety differently. Now, the big thing with that, Mary, and this is where I went off, is that as soon as you call it safety differently, your clients go, well, that's different to ours, so it must be crap. Uh, very different to ours. It can't be right. Um, if you're saying it's safety differently, you're saying ours is wrong. And we're like, it's actually nothing to do with you. Um, it's actually to do with us and our relationship with our workforce. Um, so we actually had to wind back that language of safety differently because it actually it actually turned our, some of our clients off. Didn't turn our workforce off at all, but it actually turned some of our clients off. Moni Hogg, author of The New View Safety Handbook. If there is a succinct way to do so, how do you summarize or define New View Safety? That's a great question. Look, we've, we're seeing a lot of change in the safety industry right across the globe, and there are so many challenges in looking at what that change actually means to us and our organisations. And, you know, trying to define it is, you know, trying to define a beast that's difficult to tame, shall I say. The, the preferred definition that I like to work with is really getting an understanding of the fact that we've worked towards better safety leadership in our organisations, but we're now looking to build capacity and resilience. And that's really based on the safety two type of definition. And, and you mentioned my background in motorsport. When I was coached in motorsport originally, I still remember my fast car chase police trainer saying to me, look, if you want to succeed in motorsport, you have to be really mindful that when you make a mistake, and of course in our workplaces people make mistakes all the time, and human error is part of how we operate in the world and, and what we learn from, but you can't focus on that, aka if you're in a, a spin, you don't want to look at the wall that you're about to hit. What you need to do is you need to focus on the gap that you need to get into. And drawing more on that analogy in, in motorsport, what you need to do then is ask, what do you what do we need to do as organizations to support our the people doing the work to be successful at that work and also safe because it's obviously an important part of successful work 
And if you keep it that simple, you know, you start to ask really good questions about how you can work closer with your team to co-design your safety management system. Because in practice, really, it boils down to that. When you understand that your people are smart, intelligent and very capable, and perhaps better at you than managing safety, then you'll come up with better solutions. Andrea Baker, founder of The Hop Mentor. So let's start with an understanding of what HOP means. I noticed on your website that you emphasize the word and in human and organizational performance. So what's the significance of that in how you want people to understand HOP? Yeah, so HOP is a really fascinating discipline because it's really emerged out of practices that have existed for a while, but it's emerged out of using those practices and learning from them. So um, many people have heard about the human performance space. And oftentimes, if we're looking at the history of human performance, that brings us to be look at the nuclear industry or the aviation industry um, and sort of understand the concepts of error prevention, error reduction, and in, in learning about how we actually want to be working in that error reduction prevention space, we discovered more things about how an organization has to respond in order to even allow us to improve. And HOP emerged from recognizing that, you know, all of the things that we've done in the past, whether we're talking about human performance or, you know, the study of human factors or um, if we're just talking about thinking about things through a compliance lens, all of those pieces has have lent us to make improvements. And HOP takes a look at all of them and says, okay, well, what do we want to do next? What have we learned from doing all of this, from actually executing these different types of practices? And where do we want to go next? And a lot of that has to do with um, how the organization functions, how, how we're actually communicating with each other, how we as leadership teams set ourselves up for um, response to events in response to different signals within the organization of when and where we should be improving. So that's the organizational piece um, is it kind of expands our thought process beyond maybe a, a set of tools or beyond a set of um, prescriptive requirements and moves to how do we actually use those various pieces, recognizing that we exist in an organization with a bunch of people that have a bunch of different opinions on how the world functions. Bob Edwards human and organizational performance consultant at the Hop Coach. The quote is, we can blame and punish or learn and improve, but not both. So I always took that as a blanket sort of call to learn and to avoid blame and punishment. And, and for the most part, sure. Um, I think some critics of of Hop or this kind of thinking think that there's maybe a lack of accountability, that yeah. operational learning precludes responsibility but this brings us back to context yeah because in the book you say that there can actually be a time for blame and punishment so yeah can you talk about that a little bit yeah yeah because there's some bad people there's some people we should not have hired there's some people like dang it why do we hire? i don't know we got them though we got to get them out of here so um i mean todd that's todd's quote right that you can put you can learn and prove blame and punish but you can't do both and 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 todd's brilliant at like poking you a bit with a stick, right? To make sure you're, you're awake and paying attention to what he's saying. And, and it really has stirred up a lot of conversation. But what we what we found is, is that in fact, good operational learning leads to true accountability. You know, true accountability minus the legal definition, like I'm going to hold you accountable in a court of law, uh, is a person's willingness to give an account for their actions and or to tell the story, right, of their actions. Well, I'm only going to do that if it's a safe enough place for me to tell you the truth. Because I know you know I didn't mean for a bad day to happen. And so this notion of accountability, actually, it, it, in the hop world, we get more accountability, but we don't have the old school, which actually wasn't accountability. I'm going to hold you accountable. We, we say this all the time. Accountability is intrinsic. It's a person's willingness to give an account. So it's intrinsic. I can't make you. It's almost like ownership. It is actually kind of like ownership. I can't make you, Mary, have ownership. Ownership is intrinsic. True accountability is intrinsic, but we so desperately need control, and in many cases, power and control. People, some people are literally addicted to it, that we feel like we're going to lose our power and control, and I'm going to have you know the inmates run to the prison. Last time a guy said that to me, I said it's a factory, not a prison, and they're not inmates. They can go work down the road and probably will if you don't straighten up. And so, this notion of accountability is really, really important. Now, we need to talk about it more, not less. 
And so HR disciplinary action is and always will be needed for people problems, right? You, there's a person intends harm and won't do the, if they don't fit in with the social norms, they don't get the work on time, they don't get the work done. I mean, uh, you know, that's a person problem. And the way we kind of maybe oversimplify it a bit, but basically if you could remove that person and that problem goes away, yeah, that that's where that fits in. It, otherwise, it's probably more of a systems problem. Stephen Scott, human and organizational performance consultant at Hop Improvement. During those 887 days where we were fatality free, we had some really, really scary events happen where we were just lucky no one was killed. And then we started running out of luck because, you know, luck's a terrible strategy for fatality prevention. So we, when you, when you get in a position like that, you have two choices. You can keep doing the same stuff harder or you can do something different. And we made the decision that what we were doing, doing the same stuff harder, wasn't getting us where we needed to be. So what do we need to do different? We had a lot of contacts. Alcoa had a lot of contacts in Western Australia with other big mining companies. And in, in the mining business, especially with uh, Rio Tinto, uh, they were big on this process called critical risk management, which basically says, what are the hazards that are going to kill people? What are the critical controls that are going to keep them from dying when that event occurs? And how do we manage them effectively? And so this really forces you to shift your thinking. We were thinking we could prevent every bad thing from happening. Critical risk management says, let's just assume the bad thing is going to happen. And how do we protect people when it does? When, when we first started introducing critical risk management to uh, operations people, I went to uh, almost all of the plants in, in Alcoa over the course of a couple, probably over the course of the first year, and just gave a, an informal presentation to plant leadership about what critical risk management is. And I started off with this idea that um, focusing on zero is not working. And we need to plan for failures to occur and be prepared to protect people when they do. And I, when I would get ready to cue that slide up, I would say, okay, this next one, this is a slide that would have gotten me fired a year ago. And then I would say that. And everybody, you know, people in operations, you could just see a big sigh of relief when you said that because they know that not every accident is preventable. That's why they're called accidents, right? So... They telling them that we have to assume we have to plan for bad things to occur. Our focus needs to be on how do we protect people when they do. And that just seems like such a such a much more realistic approach than telling people zero is achievable. Every accident's preventable. We just need to keep focusing on preventing the bad things from occurring. Jody Goodall, head of organizational reliability at Brady Haywood. So let's start by talking about what you mean when you say high reliability organization. Now, it may be because it's not my industry, but when I first heard the term, all these questions came to mind. Is every company in a high risk sector like mining or aerospace considered high reliability? Are there HROs in lower risk industries? Is there an official designation of some kind or is it just sort of a shorthand for doing high risk activities? So put all my questions to rest. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I suppose every uh, organisation that's in a high hazard industry would hope to and strive to be highly reliable. And, you know, the original theory was built off uh, understanding, it was back from the 80s, and it was really about understanding what are the characteristics that are common in the, you know, that top of the cream of those sectors that get it right all the time. And, you know, those sectors are nuclear, they're, you know, um, there are a lot of power generation, um, petroleum and gas, uh, some parts of mining that have, you know, I suppose big process safety risks like strata failure, um, gas explosion, things like that. Yeah, so there are certainly, you know, in, uh, as like every industry, there's a, a spectrum of of, um, of people who are doing it really, really well and ones that aren't, aren't doing it so well and, and they're the ones that seem to be in the news all the time, the ones that aren't doing it so well. Um, but those ones that get it right, that are highly predictable and reliable, they have um, a lot of characteristics that are the same and that's what was originally studied back in the 80s. And, um, you know, they kind of came up with five 
uh, characteristics and those have been you know, I would say the safety theories and um, and practices that we're hearing about now, things like HOP, um, you know, resilience engineering, all of those things um, fit beautifully into the high reliability framework as well. I, but, but they're not characteristics that belong specifically to high hazard industry. You know, there are a lot of industries that are just really complex, Mary, as well. So, you know, you might think of those like healthcare um, is a really good example, emergency services. And, you know, what we've seen over the years is actually a lot of um, the high reliability um, organisation, I'll call it HRO if that's okay. The HRO theory and practice and a lot of the papers that have been written in the last, you know, 10 or so years have actually been, come out of healthcare. So those guys are really, uh, you know, uh, taking those, the theory and the practice and, and building on it and testing it in their highly complex environment. So in short, I would say it's a set of practices or characteristics uh, that fit in organised, um, that came out of high hazard industry, but certainly are being used across uh, highly complex um, industries as well. So it started more as descriptive, just descriptive, like someone, it was studied and, and found commonalities between these organizations. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. They came up with kind of five characteristics. They're really around that ability, the mindset of the organization to have a preoccupation with failure. And, uh, you know, they're always chronically uneasy about yesterday's success and, um, and thinking that, you know, they know their organization changes all the time and it's very dynamic. So they're always thinking that failure is kind of on the cusp and, um, and how will they identify that and manage it in advance. Um, they certainly are very, you know, they're reluctant to simplify the information that's coming to them. So they don't dumb stuff down. They don't think about things as the, you know, what's immediately in front of them. They're always thinking about it from a systems perspective. Um, and they're certainly uh, sensitive to their operations. So, you know, typical organisations will have this hierarchy where, you know, the leader believes that they um, have all of the information and, um, and understand what's going on, but in a, in a HRO very much thinking about uh, what's going on at the front line and transparency of information right through the system. So they're very sensitive to what's going on uh, at the front line. Um, and that's kind of the three characteristics that make them be able to anticipate failure really well. And, um, and then there's a couple more which are around resilience and um, um, having a real commitment to being able to contain issues and recover quickly and then certainly deferring to the experts is something that you see, which is pretty unusual in a lot of other, uh, other uh, types of organisations. I think it's interesting that, you know, we, on this show, we do end up talking about a lot of different sort of newer approaches, safety differently, new view, safety too, and all of that. And, and there are discussions about, you know, how they're the same, how they're different, uh, which is better, which is worse. But it's interesting to me that it seems like this framework kind of already encompassed a lot of the stuff that we're now talking about as different. Yeah, you're right. I um I kind of do laugh at, at all the different theories because they're all bits and pieces of um of HRO theory, if you ask me. And and it's really easy to observe that when you start to just observe good practice in organization and you can see that, you know, how beautifully the hot principles fit into, as I said, that um, number three, sensitivity to operations, because that's really what it's all about is understanding the worker. And number five, which is uh, commitment to resilience, hot, uh, sorry, HRO theory, that is resilience engineering. And, you know, safety too is, is dotted all the way through there. So, um, you know, I'm certainly not um, you know, hardline any of those. Um, I think I think they all overlap themselves. And whilst everyone's kind of maybe peddling their own their own thing, if um, we just kind of as an industry and as a profession, it'd be so lovely for us just to start to think about what are the practices associated with all of these theories, and and really just recognise that we're all actually heading in the same direction. Clive Lloyd author of Next Generation Safety Leadership. I wanted to shift actually and talk a little bit about behaviorism. So in the book, you describe it as extremely common. 
you say that while the field of psychology has moved on from this approach, you don't find that the field of management has moved on yeah. from the approach. And do you think that's still the case? And, and you know, what's wrong with behaviorism? And yeah, what, what do you see when you get out there? <laughs> All right. This is a big topic. I could well get hate mail from this. I often get trolled on LinkedIn um, when I even dare um, suggest that there may be better ways. Look, let me let me put it this way. As, as psychologists, particularly when we're trained in, in the clinical aspects of psychology, we, of course, go through all the various modalities that uh, are available and have been available in psychology over the years. Uh, right back, if you will, to, to Freudian psychology, the psychodynamic approach, right up to really, really modern things like EMDR and so forth. So what we learned, uh, I went through uni, by the way, in the 90s, the early 90s. I've been doing this a long time, Eric. And even then, even back in the 90s, behaviorism was largely dead. Um, and there are reasons for that. And behaviorism, again, was purely based on only studying observable behaviors. People were not interested. And Skinner himself, the, the father of behaviorism, openly stated, not remotely interested in cognitions and especially those emotions, not interested. All we want to do is look at observable behaviors and seek to change those through conditioning, usually based on reward and punishment mentality. And so first up, you know, just hearing that, I could understand why maybe psychology had moved on from that. The very things that tend to drive behaviors are cognitions and emotions. And behaviorism just says, not interested. And so to me, it was, a, I mean, behaviorism never really worked with humans. It, it, it barely works when you're training your dog, right? If you've got a really smart dog, uh, we've, we've, <laughs> we've, got a, we've, we've got a Kelpie, right? Um, an Australian sheepdog, essentially. They are smart as a whip, sharp as a whip. And even some behave, they see through it. They, they see through it. They're just interested in getting the reward. And if they can get away with the rule, having the reward without going through the behavior, they'll do it. And that's dogs. And most of the research in behaviorism was done on dogs and pigeons. Humans are just a tad more complex than that. So behaviorism for me was out. Most um, psychologists, in fact, all psychologists that I know would not choose to use behaviorism as a modality of choice. They, they just would not because we've evolved. We've moved past that, but we've got much better ways to look at that but we still use it in safety in the form of BBS, behavior-based safety. BBS is based on behaviorism. And so again, what we're missing in BBS is what actually drives those behaviors in the first place. And unfortunately, BBS lent itself to uh, a lot of those sort of rules. If you follow the rules, you know, you get rewarded. Um, if you don't, well, you get punished. And so all we learn to do as human beings is we'll just avoid the punishment. But we just don't talk about it. We just won't admit a mistake. Um, or when we did sort of move away from the policy, we just don't let management know that. So it's really fixing nothing. It's also the, again, the unfortunate consequences. Don't get me wrong, well intended. I don't mean to attack people who run behavior-based safety things. As, as I, I believe most companies that brought BBS in did so with a good intent. I really believe that. But look at the unintended consequences, right? Um, still to this day, what we'll do is when our people have been good, and listen to the language here, right? You can't get away from this. When people have been good, done the right thing, okay, reward that. And let's. what does this look like in safety, right? We've been that magical a million hours LTI free. See that on LinkedIn every day, right? There's those self-congratulatory posts. We've got a million hours LTI free. What do we do? Well, reward, maybe a cash bonus for that. And what does that literally do? It incentivizes non-reporting. It's an unintended consequence. Plus, think about it, Mary. When we talk about behavior-based safety, whose behavior are we talking about? It's not the board's behavior. It's not the SLT's behavior. It's the workforce behavior. You cannot hold that position effectively without coming to the conclusion that why do we have incidents? Because of them, because of the workforce. Murray Ritchie, author of Seven Bad Habits of Safety Management. A lot of people are very pro on it. I think, I, well, aside from the three principles of, of accident prevention, which I've now become my 
my mantra. You know, the three, his three principles create an act of interest and safety and, uh, and fact finding and doing fast by facts. Somehow that one got thrown out. We didn't bring that one with us. So we brought the triangle with us. So people in that case, I, I basically, what Heinrich said around this triangle is that if you have so many uh, events of a similar type, so doing a similar job under the similar conditions, similar way, if you if you have that, then you know you will have this ratio uh, of actions. You know, fatality, uh, lost time, uh, unsafe back. We manipulated it so many different ways. Bird came in and manipulated it his way. We manipulated, it. but it was out of context. We take it out of context. I, I was at a, a, a professional development conference and I heard a speaker say that they were they were talking about a case study they did on one of their clients had a fatality. And the speaker said, uh, then all of a sudden, my client had a fatality. And, uh, he said, but, you know, I shouldn't have been surprised because given hundreds of triangle, it's only a matter of time for any safety professional before they have to deal with a fatality. And I thought, no, that's not what that means. That's not what it means. The other yeah. side of that, where it's taken out of context, I've seen people say, well, if we deal with all the little stuff at the bottom, none of the big stuff's going to happen. That's nonsense, too. You know, and the the Deepwater Horizon proved that. You know, seven years, no lost time, and they were hurrah, hurrah, now trips, slips, and falls, and dropped objects. Let's focus on that. And they blew the rig up. Because in the background, there were people doing consultancies and, and pushing back against the plan that they had going forward in production. So Heinrich had some, Heinrich wasn't wrong. It's what we've done with what he gave us that's wrong. Uh, likewise, I don't think the plan to check out was necessarily wrong. This is updated now, and we've implemented it. And, and it's a lot of products. A third thing that you say that may be controversial, folks, <laughs> is that uh, because a lot of my guests have strong opinions about behavior-based safety. Um, and you say, quote, there has been no concept in safety more misunderstood and implemented out of context. So I, I did want to ask you about that. How do you think people are misunderstanding it? That that has become, uh, I think, the biggest uh, misused concept in all of safety. When I was uh, first a safety person, I, I came out of the offshore medical side. I was a, a, an offshore paramedic before I got into safety. And I got into safety primarily because I got an offer and I couldn't. But I didn't really know what to do. And I could walk around the rig and say, put safety glasses on. Put your hair down. Don't run with scissors. That's about all we had. And then all of a sudden, one day, we got this beautiful package coming the, off the helicopter. And it, it, it was uh, DuPont stop system. So now I had something I could work with. I had something I could do. I thought, like, whoa, this is, okay, this is cool. And what we did is we took the, I think, we took the theories of, of behavioral-based safety and we lumped them all into behavior observations. Behavioral safe based safety has little to do with observations. Two should never be mentioned in the same sense. But when people hear behavioral based safety, they lose their mind because they've been exposed to these failed observation schemes. My belief on behavioral based safety is yeah, ob observing work is part, of it, but it's not about observing individuals for such trips and powers, housekeeping. PPD and all the stuff that we say is at the bottom of our control triangle, yet our hierarchy of controls, yet it's at the top of what we look for. I believe that when you are observing work, what you're looking for is the behavior of the organization. What is driving the work to go this way? Why are these workers not real keen on doing this this way? It's so not their behavior that you're meant to change. It's the organization's behavior. Tim Diaz, head of safety at Yarra Valley Water. So I'm going to kick the hornet's nest maybe a little bit and ask you, what's your view on behavior-based safety models? Sure. Uh, no worries. Well, that, that's uh, that, that's fine. Um, so behave, I, I'm, I don't subscribe to behavioral-based safety models. I think that they're short-sighted. Um, in its theory, it's short-sighted, I think. I, I can't draw um, in this podcast, but w when, when people approach situations at work, um, in, a, in a safety context, obviously, you know, they, they, it generates a thought about that 
situation, the thought elicits a, a, a feeling or an emotion, if you like, and that, that develops um, an attitude. So then it's our attitudes that drive our behaviours and our behaviours give us our results. What I think behavioural-based safety does is it focuses on the on the, the bottom half of that process. So it identifies behaviours and it, it, it tries to use positive or negative reinforcers to correct or maintain those behaviours to give management the results that they want. But what it overlooks is the attitudes that people are bringing uh, to work or, or e- even just in that moment. So it does not appreciate or factor in their motivation. Um, it doesn't um, factor in you know, their, their stress levels at their times, their, their attitudes, their belief systems, um, all those sort of things. So I feel like behavioural-based safety is, is half of the equation and that any benefits from behavioural-based safety programs, in my view, are short-lived as soon as that supervisor or manager or safety member who's performing a behavioural-based safety observation turns their back and leaves, the the behaviour of the worker returns to the manner that it was before the observation commenced. So it's really about getting into the heads heads of of your workforce, understanding what um, what drives them, what motivates them, what the challenges are, and and then really trying to influence at that deeper level rather than this surface level uh, approach of behavioural-based safety. Andrea Baker founder of The Hop Mentor. In the course of interviewing uh, various guests, I've heard a lot of different terms. So like new view, safety differently. Um, A lot of them seem to be influenced by the work of Todd Conklin and Sidney Decker. Are these all synonymous with HOP or um, is this what you're talking about when you're saying, you know, taking different um, frameworks that we've already been working with and and putting them together? Oh, that's a really good question and probably... um hard to detangle and probably the history, whoever writes the history book on it is going to make the determination as to what that actually looks like, right? Because for at least from my seat, what it seems like is that there are many, many similarities between those terms that you have, right? So that new view or safety two or safety differently, HOP, there are more similarities than there are differences. And I think that there's a slightly different flavor to each of them, depending upon the background of the individuals that help speak to the concepts. But all of them are based on things that we've learned in our safety journey, you know, throughout industry. Right. So they all have sort of the same starting point of looking at where we've come from, kind of the gaps that we've seen in improving. Um, but they have a different flavor depending upon, you know, the the advocates that that speak to them. Elisa Lynch. Head of Organizational Learning and Performance at K4 Consultancy. I'd like to start by orienting the conversation around your understanding of the concepts that we're talking about. So we'll no doubt end up using these terms as shorthand. So let's get a sense of how you understand, uh, we'll, we'll call them safety one and safety two. And here's the critical bit, how you understand them as defined by their practitioners or advocates okay uh so safety one or traditional safety um i would understand as command and control i would understand it as a very rigid system where you are doing safety to people basically and safety two or safety differently or new view i would understand it to be a more collaborative approach where you are doing safety with people and more specifically, with the people who are at the point of risk. So traditional safety, safety management plans, risk assessments, all that jazz done from behind a desk and, and, and sent out from upon high. And, um, and, then, and then the kind of more uh, new view would be more collaborative. That's my take on what they... On, on how they, yeah, on how they view it. Okay, so now we'll jump into uh, what do you mean when you say... Safety one, commander control, traditional safety. And I'm throwing these terms all in the same bucket. Uh, so please let me know if that's a misconception. But how do you see these ideas showing up in practice? In practice, I suppose I see traditional safety showing up as safety officers marching around with clipboards, pissing people off. And, and I say that because I've been that person. Like, who's your man that parted the waters? <laughs> Like literally walking through a site and people are just fucking scattering as you're coming because they don't want to talk to you. Um, so yeah, that would be, um, that's my view of it. That's how I would describe it uh, versus when 
I take a more, I suppose, new view collaborative approach. It's you're walking through site and people are happy to see you coming and they're like, hey, how's things? And you can have a conversation and have a chat and uh, and people come to you with problems versus I would have found in, in my experience of a, a traditional approach, people would hide things. So very much under-reporting, cover up of things, all that kind of jazz. Do you think safety two is really new or do you think it's a case of rebranding old ideas? I don't think it's new. Um, I probably did when I heard about it first. I was like, oh, mind blown. This is unbelievable. And actually the first time I had heard about it, I was at a workshop in Sydney by one of the kind of, I suppose, the thought leaders, one of the founders of Safety Differently. And I thought (laughs) he was crazy. I was like, this is never going to take off. This is never going to become a thing. But um, yeah, it's, I think maybe they've just, and it might be social media. It might be that kind of thing that has has gained traction for these ideas. Or maybe it's just really engaging people, the likes of the Sydney Deckers and those who who are, I suppose, drawing people in. They're, they're engaging. Uh, they're controversial. I don't think the ideas are new. Uh, I was actually, I was doing a, uh, I went back to university two years ago and uh, I was doing an assignment and next thing I was reading up on James Reason or something it was from like late 80s, early 90s. And it was all about organizational drift. I was like, hang on a second. <laughs> I was like, this shit's from the 90s. This isn't new. But the, what I will say is that I hadn't ever heard of any of the theories before. When I was working in, when I was engaged with traditional safety, you kind of go into a company. This is, again, this is my experience of it. You go into a company, the safety management system is set up. It's there. And you just, you slot in. And then you just keep the cogs turning. There's no real creativity in it. There's no, there's nothing new in it. So they, they don't need to tell you what the background is or where these theories came from. It's set. There it is. There you go. Just follow the system. Whereas I guess with New View, because it was under such scrutiny, you do have to go, well, well where has this come from? And if they can, now they probably could refer back a bit more to some, I could credit a bit more, I think, on some of the ideas that are out there now. Don't shoot me, I haven't read all the Safety Differently books. Maybe they are citing more than what I realise. get a lot of my info from LinkedIn, blogs. But uh, yeah, that's um, that's my take on it. James McPherson, host of the Rebranding Safety podcast. So there's New View, Safety 2, Safety Differently, and then Hot gets thrown in there too. Are there important differences between these or are we just finding several different, slightly different angles to say the same thing Hmm. so this is where this gets really it's like the safety version of like really sensitive conversations isn't it where people just start getting really uppity i I do genuinely think that you need all of them i do think they are all different um i think a lot of them overlap which is not necessarily a bad thing um so therefore some people could sell one or commit to one and potentially be doing all of them but send it as that one brand if that makes sense so they might say oh i'm hop for example and and therefore they're, they're selling it as hop but ultimately there is a bit of safety too in there and, and whatever so I, I do genuinely see them all as different tools i kind of the way that i kind of describe it on rebrand safety is that, that why would you commit to one like you wouldn't go to a buffet and only eat one bit of the buffet would you so um and, and ultimately what bit you need depends on where you are as a company uh for me and what your position is what your risks are and your maturity and who you're talking to as well you've got human performance which i think is the one that probably gets the most bickering, the second most bickering maybe, because I probably set some houses on fire when I kind of say this, but ultimately for me, hop and and behavior-based safety are very much the same. Like in their practices, if you were to look at the way the hop is sold from say like Conklin, who's kind of like the guard, the godfather, I suppose, of that. And then you look at Geller, who is like, the godfather of BBS, they're a carbon copy of each other. They're exactly the same. And you'll watch keynotes of them bickering with each other about the same thing. Um, and it, and it's, it's very frustrating as a practitioner, but they are really talking about the same thing. They just use slightly different words. 
but ultimately their, their practices are the same. So I think the label, the bickering is mostly just on on the label. Um, so I think your performance is where most of the bickering comes from. I think the second bickering that, that comes from that's unhelpful is safety differently. So safety differently is a phenomenal marketing tool um, and has, uh, you know, controversy and bickering and tribalism is a great marketing tool. We've used it for many, many years. Um, and I think Decker did a very good job of that. And ultimately, there are another academic side that just don't like anything safety differently. Um, I think safety differently and the, and the books from safety differently are very good as a kind of a glass smash moment. They're good at opening the door like a gateway book or a gateway theory to other things. And then that leads you into safety two, which for me is all about resilience um, uh, and the ability to respond and stuff like that. So you can't just have resilience. You also need some form of operational human performance practice as well. Then you've got high reliability uh, organizations, which is a bit of resilience and a bit of learning organizations, a bit of human performance. So you kind of need all of those as well. So <clears throat> that's that's how we kind of come at it is that safety differently typically is a very good way to open the door uh, and get the conversation started. Um, a lot of Decker's work is very, very good. Uh, a lot of Conker's work is very, very good, but also a lot of Geller's work is very, very good. Um, so it, I think there's a lot of these podcasts where we have a lot of conversation about how bad the practitioners are and how wrong the practitioners are getting it. Not many podcasts are saying, actually, the academics are making this a hell of a lot harder for us pa practitioners by creating a lot of tribalism. It's really hard for a practitioner now to work out how do we actually do this at work? But yeah, our, our kind of core focus is really all of them. It's a collection of four core focuses, culture, human performance, learning, organiza um, organizational learning, and then risk and resilience. And for me, you can't have one of them, with all of them. Well, first of all, so do you think all this conversation about labels and all this stuff, do you think it's kind of wasted air? Like, or do you think it's a healthy debate? Yeah, some some, some is and some isn't. I, I think we're going through like a period of change, so an, an evolution. So I think... You, the trade-off of that is that you have to have these conversations and some of it will naturally become wasted air. So I just think it's like a, it is it is just a, a natural issue that evolution brings, if that makes sense. We have to bicker. It, and, and, and remember that academics are supposed to bicker. Like that's literally their job is to say, this is my theory. And then the other one goes, no, this is my theory and you're wrong. And you're The problem is that academia has now become an industry where profitability is a, is a, is a thing that they're, you know, is commercialized. So we've got an issue now that academia is not really academia. It's a business. Karsten Busch, safety mythologist and historian. I wanted to, again, read a quote from the, the thesis. Many authors and safety professionals revert to an extreme position by either unquestioningly accepting and echoing Heinrich's ideas or a contemporary derivative of those ideas, or dismissing them entirely with rather little middle ground. So I wanted to ask you, what is the middle ground? Is there an ideal blend? <laughs> I'm not sure if that's the right way to ask oh, it. Oh, uh, there, there, there probably is. I, I don't know where it is, the ideal blend. But um, I, I uh, think uh, Eric Holnagel uh, says this quite nicely. Um, Eric Holnagel uh, brought the idea of safety too. Uh, but he says uh, you both need uh, the traditional safety, safety one, as he has labeled it, and uh, safety two to be uh, really successful. So I think we shouldn't do away uh, all the old stuff from Heinrich and, and others because uh, there, there's a lot uh, good in it. There, there are also some things that we probably should stop doing uh, in, in the traditional uh, safety, but uh, we can't do without it. Uh, to do use a really stupid example, uh, I, I don't think that we wouldn't like to fly with a plane that wasn't built on safety one principles, whereas stuff was thoroughly engineered and risk assessed and, and all that. Uh, but then um, uh, using that plane, 
uh, we probably would like uh, pilots and so on to be uh, as resilient as they can uh, can get and being hand, uh, able to handle all kinds of eventualities. And... Dr. Linda Martin, HSC consultant at LF Martin. There are so many theories out there right now of how safety professionals should be implementing, how they should be applying their craft. What what is what is the theory that you go by? What is the theory that I go by? And and really what we should be focusing on, which is is something in between the theory and the actual application of the work. Okay. So when you said, you know, where do we need to get to from where we are? I think we need to go backwards a little bit. I'm going to get a lot of crap for that. But I think safety professionals have gone into this realm of just like talking this stuff to death, like your LinkedIn page and and having this conversation. And what we really have gotten away from is actually being with the workers and, and helping them figure out what their ultimate goal is, which is to go home safe every day, right? So I don't like any of that conversation about safety one, safety two, safety differently. Ha. I've always said, and I say this a lot on my own podcast, it just depends. Okay. And it, and it just depends right down to your specific company that you're working with or your specific work group that you're working with. And all of those theories can apply at once. And I think we need to use a little bit of street smarts and a lot less of of the book smarts and the, I'm going to invent a new theory. Um, I think I saw somebody today on, on LinkedIn and they said the new investigative theory of something or other. And I was just like, I, I don't even know what that means. I mean, like, is that, is that a thing? Because the way I do safety is I get right down in there and whatever works is what works. So would you say that there's maybe um, it, it's moved too much into the too much talk, not enough walk kind of uh, realm. Too much, too much debate about theory. I guess hundred percent, hundred percent, right? So if we kind of take this back to a lot of things that I talk about, right? I talk about there's this divide. You know, we've got the people who think they're kind of pseudo academics on one side. They have a degree in safety. They're talking about all these theories. And then the other side, we have the boots on the ground, people that never talk about those things and don't have that degree in safety and are are just out there working, helping keep people safe every day, right? And we need both, right? But the divide has become so great that we've got a lot of people over on the on the right hand over here with their degrees in safety talking about all this theory. And I never see any of them actual actually out there with the workers, right? And by the same token, nobody's teaching the theory to the people who are boots on the ground and could use that help, right? And so I, I think the only way forward is to to bring everybody together and move them forward, forward together as a group. Elisa Lynch, Head of Organizational Learning and Performance at K4 Consultancy. What would you say to safety veterans who maybe feel that this this whole discussion, this whole debate between old and new is theoretical and maybe not all that valuable? I would say that I would I would hope that I try to understand their point of view. There's a lot of, I suppose, yeah, safety veterans that have been in the game a very long time, have probably witnessed some horrific injuries or accidents, deaths, all that kind of thing. So I don't think that we should be dismissive ever in that way um but same thing i don't think they should be dismissive of new view um now i think the discussions and the battles that happen on linkedin or between some of the academics or some of the big names or heavy hitters are kind of like whatever their background noise don't really pay attention much anymore the conversations need to be happening between actual practitioners and you need to seek those out murray ritchie author of Seven Bad Habits of Safety Management. We have to change how we're educating safety practitioners, safety professionals. We have to uh, change how we're, how we're uh, regulating safety. We have to change how we're managing safety. We have to go back. The only time I want to go back to the 1930s is just as Heinrich's three basic principles. Develop an interactive interest, active interest in safety. Find facts base your progress on those facts not flavor of the day not slip strips and fall 
not all well, you know, not all we're going to have a safety policy today. We're going to have all looks. We're going to have, we're going to call it this. Well, we're going to call it that. Let's call it this. There's a lot of really good work going on. I think we need to get rid of the labels. You know, I, I think safety differently is a good concept. I think hot is a good concept. I think all of those things are good concepts. We just have to, as a, as a profession, we have to be very mindful that we're not implementing them out of context and taking them as a magic bullet. That there's pieces of all those things that we can use to encourage people to participate, find facts, and to fix those facts before somebody gets hurt. And I think it's, to me, it's rather simple. Dr. Todd Lusheen, HSE Associate Professor at the University of Wisconsin. What I was wanting to ask about is uh, there are a lot of, I don't know if I should call them uh, theories, philosophies, points of view. There's you know, new view, uh, human and operate and uh, organizational performance. There's safety one, safety two, command and control. There's all these labels. Do you feel like sometimes as you get older that that things, ideas are maybe coming back to the fore that have already existed, but under some other guise, like it maybe they're rediscovered or remarketed, or I'm not sure like, do you, do you sometimes get the idea that that the younger people are saying, this is a great new idea, and older people are saying, no, it's not, but in fact, they actually agree when it comes down to it, when you get past the labels and everything? Well, yeah, of course. Um, I do see that. And again, it's the path. You know, the further you get, the higher you get on the path, the more viewpoint you have. And then you kind of understand things a little bit more. The, all these ideas, sure, they, I, I don't, here, here's what I want to, want to just say a disclaimer quick. I don't think people are taking other people's ideas, claiming they're their own by repackaging it. I don't think there's anything going, and I, you didn't intend that, but I want the listeners to understand we're not, that's not what we're saying. What we're saying is they have a discovery. They've experienced something on their path that maybe makes it a little bit, un, maybe it was an epiphany for them. Like I have to share people. And the easiest way to do that is to provide it with a new title or label so they can differentiate it from the other things. Well, the people who have been through that area, it's like, yeah, you know, we called it this, you call it that. It's not the same, but there's no reason to put it down. It's new to them and it helps them understand. Can we then look back at our past and our experiences and relate to how we felt when we discovered what it was called back then? And that's okay. And here's the thing too. Maybe there is something additional there. Maybe there is... But, or maybe there's something missing from the one we thought. Now we should reach out to them and, you know, add to it. So it, but you're right. It's, it's, I see too much of this immediate rejection. And I, I really think that if, if these are true scholars, that <laughs> what they should be doing is attempting to contribute positively to the body of knowledge versus attempting to chop things off just because it's something similar to, there's, it's just, you know, kind of something similar they knew, different name. I, I, I just don't see how can we really progress and grow if what we're doing is, you know, shutting down every new idea that comes along, you know, pretty soon people are going to be afraid to share new ideas or share their experiences. And it's, it's, let's, let's bring it down to our practice. Now, if, if workers come to us with ideas and we're just putting them down, that won't work. That's too expensive they're going to stop bringing the ideas. And I'm sorry, I mean, you know, if you, if you know, if you really practice safety, you'll know how important what I just said is if you are quieting people, even if they have more of a dissenting viewpoint, you're going to miss something. You're not going to understand the full picture of what's going on. Sam Goodman, human and organizational performance consultant. So for new pros, I would like for them to really understand uh, kind of what I was, what I was hitting on there in the book. Is that these folks have been fighting these battles. These folks have been clawing trench warfare, you know, a few feet at a time. They have been clawing organizations forward for the entire uh, course of their career. They've, they've not just got there and sat down in the chair and gone, well, I've sat here for 30 years and did nothing. That's not what happened. Those folks have been fighting through all these different evolutions of what we call safety, the safety of work going through all that, bringing new thought into the organizations, trying to pull it forward. So what I would like for them to really focus on is to take that stuff and carry it into the future. Not necessarily, and what I mean by that is not just picking up what they've done and say, this is what we're doing. 
but building up on it, making things better, you know, we're taking those lessons that we've learned as organizations. Well, we tried that for a long time. That doesn't work. So we're going to leave that back there. We're going to try something a little different, but this worked really well. So I guess what I'm saying is don't go in and seek to burn everything down. Uh, even as I kind of talk about traditional safety stuff and just for lack of a better term, we'll say new view kind of safety stuff. The idea isn't to just burn everything out of organization and say, we start from scratch. There's a, so much great stuff from that traditional, those traditional ideas that we need to hang on to. So I'll use that as an example for new safety pros. It's like, take what's good, carry it forward, make it better. If it sucks, work on getting rid of it, add to make things better. But don't look back on those 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 seasoned pros or those folks that have come before you and just take the knowledge that you know now that we that we that we understand better about the safety of work and say how how stupid they were. Because they were operating with the information they had at the time and they did a pretty damn good job of it. So there there is a healthy dose of kind of paying your respect to those folks that have come before you and carrying those lessons forward not just living in them, but carrying them forward, making them better and moving safety beyond, like moving it into kind of this next generation. Pam Woloski, president-elect of the ASSP Board of Directors. To me, the most important thing is that we are a profession and we have to constantly evolve. And even though 30 years ago or 40 years ago, we might've believed certain things, as any, like any profession, we've evolved and we're continuing to evolve. And, you know, as a professional, I, I take it to be very important that I try to evolve and uh, modify my practices and implement the kinds of practices that uh, show the best possibility for an outcome. Um, and so I think, you know, even though we've made some changes over the years, I don't think that we as a profession have to feel like we were doing it wrong. And now the way is right. It's just an evolution and will continue to evolve. And 20 years from now, when I'm no longer working, maybe, hopefully, people will be doing different things. And, uh, you know, that's an important part of any profession. And I think we have to give ourselves credit for being willing to be open and learn and evolve. Safety Labs is created by Slice, the only safety knife on the market with a finger-friendly blade. Find us at sliceproducts.com. Until next time, stay safe. Yeah.